showed that video at the start because everything starts or falls from how you see yourself. Everything starts or falls from how you view yourself. You can have your self-view, you can have the view of others imposed on you, or you can have how the king who purchased your victory and is the only person who has a right to give you an identity, how he sees you is flawless. And you can be aware of your mistakes and you can be so aware of your shortcomings and your inhibitions and even your limitations, but still when it's through the rose-tinted, blood-speckled eyes of God who sees you through his son Jesus, everything he calls you to do, he calls you to do it not because he's testing you or provoking you, but because he loves you and he wants you to know you have been designed to make an impact in the world, to enjoy the life he's given you, and to bless this planet with your presence. Don't apologize for being alive. Bless God that you've got breath in your body and run after everything he's got for you. Amen. Amen. So we're going to stand together and we're going to read the word of God together. So let's stand. Now, we're using two translations for our key scriptures today. So for that reason, we'll pop them up on the screen because I've only got one version here. Pop these scriptures up for us, guys, and we'll read 1 Peter 3.15, and then we'll read Proverbs 11.3.30. Clear your throat. <clears throat> and in your best shower or bath in the morning voice, <laughs> Lamus Follow me then. But Father, already in our hearts, we are blessed by your presence. But here we have our minds too. And because we've read these scriptures, we are already forming a view of what we think might be said to us. Lord, I ask you today to surprise us. I ask you today to inspire us. I ask you today to throw curveballs into our preconceived ideas with revelation of your Holy Spirit. And I ask you, Lord, to bless every person with ears to hear and eyes to see what your Spirit is saying to the church. Father, I thank you that there's no d distance that your Spirit can't cross. We're online. We're watching this months after we shared it live here today. We're in the room right at this moment. You can speak, and we can be blessed. Amen. Go on then, grab your seat. There's a couple of things in life you just can't get away from. You have obligations and you have responsibilities. You have duties and requirements on your life. And you have, you have expectations, some of which are reasonable, some of which feel unfair from time to time, but all of them designed for you to mature and grow as a person. You can't vote when you're five years old. You have to reach a certain age before you're allowed to do that. You can't get married when you're seven. I was just recalling as I was preparing this marriage, uh, this marriage, <laughs> this wedding, that in primary school, probably primary four or primary five, I got married. But thankfully, it wasn't an official celebrant. And thankfully, neither of us had any interest in the wedding continuing into a marriage after playtime. It was a short-lived commitment. It was really just to play a part in life. But as I share this message today, it is about one of your duties and obligations as a Christian, but I think I can show you from another angle so that you can see this duty is actually a delight. This uh, duty is actually a privilege and an honor. This is not an I've got to. This is actually I get to. And the reason I'm sharing it is 
God wants you blessed. And there are certain things God puts before us and says, if you do this, you will be blessed. But not only does God want to bless us, he wants to help us do the things that we do to be blessed. Now, here's the curveball, the first one. With God, you don't move from unblessed to blessed. When you're a Christian, you're blessed. I mean, if you're not a Christian, you might have been blessed to a degree, but blessed with a capital B happens when you invite Jesus to become your Lord and your Savior. He comes to live inside of you, and from that moment, you are blessed. So you move from blessing to blessing. You don't move from nothing to something. You move from blessing to blessing, and it increases and it grows, and you start to see things differently. And it's as if the more you partner and connect and walk with God, the more you see the opportunities He's stored up for you to be blessed. But there are some things you can't shortcut, and there are some things you can't get around, and there are no loopholes for them. And one of them is speaking the language of the kingdom of God. Now, this is not a sermon about words today. I'm not ready to preach that yet. I'm still working on that. But it is a, ser a sermon or a message about speaking about the hope that we have in our hearts about Jesus. And they're linked to how you will grow as a Christian. So if you're tweeting or stealing stuff from my message for your next message, steal this or tweet this, if you speak up, you can grow up. See, sometimes the first thing that the devil knows to stop our growth is silence our mouths. Instead of speaking out what God wants us to speak out, we ponder things in our heads and in our hearts, and they easily shift from faith to fear. You ever found yourself worrying about something? And then you go to the Word and you realize there's a lot in the Word about this situation and you start to speak that out and the worry abdicates the throne of your mind and peace comes again. We speak up because we grow up. Now, you long to see the supernatural. You long to see God's amazing power in your life. But the truth is, if there's nothing supernatural going on in your life, it's probably because there's nothing supernatural coming out your mouth. The first thing God does when he wants something amazing to happen is he speaks about it. The demonstration of God's power and the declaration of God's gospel go hand in hand. Everything you long to see is described by Jesus himself as a sign following. It's not a sign as a precursor to something. It's a sign to confirm something. So God speaks it, and then it happens. And so you speak it, and then it happens. They work hand in hand. But as soon as we say phrases like evangelism, sharing your faith, witnessing, we all go, uh-oh. This is one of those sermons I should have volunteered for security duty <laughs> so that I was out there, because I know I should do that, but man... You know, every, every time, I know, I, I feel the same. <laughs> every time I try, the, the words don't come out right. The, I trip myself up, I miss my opportunity, I kick myself and I feel bad. And instead of being excited about the opportunity to share about the goodness of God, I find myself living with a guilt that I don't have the bottle to do it, right? Maybe just me. But the truth is, we've all tried to communicate and we've all had experiences where it's gone wrong. Have a look at a couple of these predictive text bloomers I found online over the weekend. People trying to text each other. I got a text from one of the leaders in this church at one time said, I look forward to seeing you for sex. 
That is not what they meant. I sat at my desk one day, true story, and an email came in from my wife and an email came in from the church office at exactly the same time. And my wife's email, she in the room, oh dear, no lunch for me then. My wife's email essentially said, Craig, you've been working a lot of evenings and weekends. If you come home tonight, I will put a smile on your face. Perhaps a nice meal, a movie I want to watch. Kids don't have such dirty minds. Youth leaders, youth pastors don't have such dirty minds. So as I read that email, another one came in and said, can you send me the list of those you know are confirmed from baptism on Sunday night? So I sent the church officer a reply and I sent my wife a reply. The problem is I got my replies mixed up. And I sent my wife, as far as I know, there are 27 people wanting to be baptized on Sunday night. And I sent the church office an email saying, well, if you're making me that kind of offer, how can I resist? I will be home at six o'clock. I can't wait to see you. And here are a few ideas about what I think you should do to make a smile on my face. Now, if that isn't bad enough, the church receptionist opted to go for her lunch and a volunteer sat at her desk just as I sent that email. My attempts at communication didn't go the way I wanted them to go. Over Christmas, I was watching an episode of Only Fools and Horses, a, a, an old 80s sitcom here in the UK, and Del Boy's trying to explain to Rodney they can't go out because there's a flu virus touching everybody in the pub. And he says, Rodney, we can't go out. It's an academic. <laughs> he meant it was an epidemic. Our communication just doesn't always work. You ever been in a land where they don't speak your language? What do you do? You say to someone, can you tell me where I can change my money? No, I speak English. <laughs> so what do you do? You slow down so that they can't understand you slowly <laughs> instead of fast. Oh no, no English, no problem. Can you tell me where I can change my money. We've all done it. Maybe you go abroad like us and you add la or oleo to the end of every word in English so that it sounds like, so you're in France. Oh, la subway, silver play. The la way to la, la Eiffel Tower, no? We went to Spain one time. I'm already in trouble at home, so I'll just tell you this story as well. <laughs> we decided for our pool we needed goggles. So Lois walked into the little shop at the top of our apartment block and said to the guy, Goglios? Goglios? I mean, go, guy, guy, oh, Goglios! We had oleo to everything. I mentioned Del Boy there. Here's a couple of Del Boy's failed attempts to impress people with his parlance for the language of au français. Have a look at these, just so you know you're not alone. French phrases, neither. What do you mean soppy French phrases? La bon vie, you See you what I mean? Oh. Del, you can't speak French. You're still struggling with English. saint very mal de mar. Still, never mind, eh? Ha, vive la France, as they say in Rome. <laughs> Je ne sais quoi, aren't you, eh? Ah. Oi, uh, garçon, la petite poire. <laughs> yeah. The French have a saying, Rodney. Bully boys, mon ami. Menere d'etre. <laughs> no, far away. Champs Elysees, the French say. <laughs> a Buenos Aires. <laughs> You've no très bien en somme, as the French say. No, it's like as the French say, it's a, it's a fait accompli. <laughs> oh, Bain Marie, Bain Marie. <laughs> Mind la plume de la maton. <laughs> it's, well, boeuf a la mode, as the French say. <laughs> it's que sera sera, as the French say. <laughs> Pardon him, Um uh, <laughs> El Wally, yeah? <laughs> Bonsoir. Bonjour, monsieur. Vous restez à l'hôtel? De France, uh, de fumée. <laughs> Avec uh, vous, de bonheur? Oui, merci. Oh. Oui, garçon. Dos de bonheur, pas de Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> de quelle partie? 
partie de la France êtes-vous? Ah oui, oui, j'ai quand même un jet de Sur les pommes d'Avignon. Pardon, monsieur. That'll do, that'll do. Give the old boy a round of applause for helping us share the message today. We've all felt like this in our attempts to share the hope that we have in us, don't we? We know we should, we know we want to, but we find ourselves stuck with where do you, and we find ourselves standing, you know, all of these needs and all of these desires to do the right thing, but we find ourselves clumsily navigating our way towards obedience. But actually, the kingdom of God gives us a language. I read you two verses, but there is another place where the Bible says, don't worry about what you have to say, because the Holy Spirit in that moment will actually give you the words. You see, when you're a born-again follower of Jesus Christ, the language God gives you can actually shape our culture. We can use our culture to shape their language, so it works in dual ways. We have a language that can shape the culture that we find ourselves trying to reach, but we also have a culture that can shape the language of those that we're trying to reach. God has got this from both angles. He's got it covered. I was at one of the first fearless events we had in here, and I thought Stephen preached a good message, but one of the kids said he thought it was wicked. We'd used a word, but we'd changed the meaning of it. I asked them why the queue was bigger for the Brooking Bronco than it was for the Bouncy Castle, and one of the kids said, no, because the Brooking Bronco's sick. I said, that's lovely. They're all praying for the poorly buffalo. They've changed the words to suit their culture, and it all starts with language. We are a modern society now, but stories still shape our culture, and stories still shape our language. Let me prove it to you. To infinity and it's just a story. Let me give you another one. Hakuna. How do you know the language of Simba, Pumbaa, and Timon? because you've been shaped by the story. Your life is a small story and a large story. And God wants to anoint you and equip you and empower you and enable you and inspire you and provoke you to tell His story, which is our story, which is your story. And as we've sung already today, it's a story that saves our souls and changes our lives. God didn't bring me to church to get me to believe in something that made me want to be better. God created something entirely new when I put my faith in Jesus Christ. This is not an upgrade. This is brand new. And every day, it's still brand new. And tomorrow, it will be brand new. The gospel isn't an appendix to the Christian life. It's the mountain on which the Christian stands to build their life. It's good news when you first hear it, but it remains good news every time you hear it. And it works as good news in every area of your life. You are flawless, but you don't have to be perfect to share this message. You're perfect as far as God is concerned if you know Jesus because Jesus lives in you and your story will work because when you tell your story, Jesus makes it work. We just watched that great video. I only saw that for the first time yesterday. But essentially what it says is it changes whatever you've got into whatever he needs. Maybe my story would be it changes a failure into someone faithful. But there's a story in your heart that needs to be told. And if you want to grow as a believer, if you want to increase in your maturity, if you want to feel the presence of God more closer in 2018 than you've ever felt it before, work on your story. Because whenever he's talked about, he turns up. 
It's always been the way that he takes imperfect people to tell the greatest story ever told. You can see how your story fits into his story. I'm just going to break it down for you really easy. I'll show you four sections, and then I'll give you two things to do, and then I'll send you out the door to do it. I'll break it into these sections. Creation, fall, redemption, new creation. Let's say those together so that we don't forget them. Creation, fall, redemption, new creation. Creation, fall, redemption, new creation. You, as I remind you of his story, you will see your story, and you'll even begin to notice how others tell their story. Every movie has the same pattern. Every novel has the same pattern. Every story, every life is built on the same things. First one, creation. Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God. The story begins with God. The New Testament's the same. The Apostle John wrote it this way, John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Everything comes into existence by God's Word. Say amen. Our identity, our purpose, and the truth that we hold to are all to be found in God's Word and God's works. The beginning of the story is not a story about us, it's a story about Him. Your story fits into his story. Maybe you're frustrated today because you keep trying to get him to fit into your story. Maybe you're trying to get Jesus to follow you when your story only makes sense when you follow Jesus. But the creation always begins the same way. God's word, God's works. God speaks to Adam and Eve, as you know, and they're fine so long as they believe God's Word. In fact, they're better than fine. It is very good, God's view of things. How He sees it is, mm -mm. He, built, he builds creation over five days. Then He adds a sixth day, and at each point in the five, He says, good, 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 good. Then He takes some dust and forms a man, Mm -hmm. Very good. You ever heard that said in church? Sometimes somebody says something in the preaching and somebody goes, very good. That was, they're imitating God at that point. I sometimes catch myself doing that. Very good. I translate very good as I am going to steal that. <laughs> so everything's perfect because God has spoken and man has been created and man is walking in line with the spoken word. It's, as Del Boy would say, vive la France, couche As the A-team would say, I love it when a plan comes together. And all is well in the garden, so long as they believe God's words and do God's work. The truth is, you'll never be happy until you trust God's word and you do God's work. You'll find some sense of peace you might progress that things are better than they used to be before, but if you want your world to be viewed as an Eden, you must ask God, what do I need to do for this dominion to be blessed? And God simply says, do, listen to my word and do my works. There's no sickness, there's no sin, there's no shame, there's no lack, there's no fear, there's no worry. God has spoken. Man doesn't know any different. I'm on it. It's good. But of course, that's about to change, isn't it? What changed? The fall. They stopped believing. They stopped trusting God's work. And they stopped trusting God's word. They began to imagine, could there be another way? Fueled by the inaccurate whispers of a crafty devil, but nevertheless, the problem was unbelief. God had spoken a word. God had given work to do. 
and all was well. And along comes this crafty liar and begins to say, did God really say? If you do eat of that fruit, I think this will happen. And they stopped believing what was working. They sin, they fall, they hide. It's the biggest tragedy on the earth. There'll never be a story on the news headlines that's ever more tragic than this one, more catastrophic for the human race than this one. The minute you stop believing God's word and God works, the only way is down. And you have to know something today. You take people with you when you go down. It's never just you. However, when you come up, and I'll get to that in a minute, you never come alone. You bring others with you. You don't know the things that you've been saved from. God will show you in eternity, and you will be surprised. But right now, we're in a garden, and we're hiding. And God says, where are you? He never needed to ask that question before. We were naked, so we've hid. Listen to what God says. Who told you you were naked? In other words, whose words are you believing instead of mine? I had you covered. Do you know when they were covered, they were naked? They were transparent before God. They had no need for any other covering but God. Who told you you were naked? Whose words have you listened to over my words? Hey, who told you cancer was terminal? Who told you debt was permanent? Who told you you'll just have to listen to, you'll just have to find coping mechanisms for your depression? Who told you that you'll just have to grin and bear anxiety? Who told you that, well, you've got an inferiority complex, you'll always be shy. Who told you? You never got it from your Creator. You never got it from His Word, and it was not as a product of His work. Another voice has come into your garden and has started to untangle your creation to bring it into an ambush called a fall. The death was spiritual. I can't hear God. The death was relational. I don't know where God is. And then a few years later, the death was physical. They had to die when they did never deny. I said to you a few minutes ago, you never do it yourself. Their children come along and their boy Cain kills their boy Abel. Why? Unbelief. You bring an offering, I'll accept it. And somebody whispers in Cain's ear, don't bring the offering God wants, bring a compromised offering. Abel brings the offering that God wants. He is aspiring to get back to creation from the fall. I'll accept his offering. I won't accept yours. Why are you so surprised? I never said I would accept that. And murder enters the fall. So you and I are born, we no longer know God or what we should know about God, we don't know. We've got opinions and views and theories and YouTube, but we've no idea what to think about God. And some of the things we believe about God are absolute lies. And please remember, primarily this message is for the church. Of course, I hope an unbeliever hears it and it helps them find their way back to God's Word and God's work. But what is it you should know about God that you don't know? You've heard others speak of it, but it's never been your experience. What lies are you believing about God? And the worst thing of all, because of the fall, because of the whispers, what we do know, we don't act on it. We believe it, but we've never learned to receive it. And in a couple of weeks' time, we're going to come back to that. Because I think the church needs a whole fresh revelation on how to receive from God. But that wasn't the end of the story either, was it? 
there was creation, there was fall, but then there was redemption. Genesis 3.15. I'll just paraphrase it for you for the sake of time. Through Eve's offering, Satan, your head will be crushed. You may have won the battle in the garden, but you haven't won the war for the cosmos. Later, the book of Hebrews and the book of Revelation give us a clue. God knew what was going down, and God had it covered before it went down. It says, Jesus Christ was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. In other words, Adam and Eve, another son who will come, who will put right what you've made wrong. Jesus is that son. He's a better Adam, but he's a better Abraham. He's a better Moses and he's a better Israel. All of these people were called by God to hear his word and do his work and to present to the world what God was really like. And to a degree, some succeeded, but pretty much they failed. So another son had to come. Jesus comes. He lives the life we're supposed to live perfectly, trusting and submitting to God the Father. He takes Satan's invitation to live in unbelief rather than belief, to live in doubt rather than fear, to live in sin rather than perfect obedience, and tells him where to put it. That's my older brother. Steps in on my behalf and says to Satan, thou can't live by bread alone. It is written, he makes a spectacle of him. He dies on the cross, of course. He who knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. He actually did take your sin. He actually did have it upon his body, in his heart, and in his soul. It wasn't just a figurative sacrifice. He became sin. Everything ugly about you was laid on him so that everything beautiful about him could be laid on you. You say, if I'm not a Christian, am I ugly? No, you said that. I never said that. But I'm an ugly Christian. No, you're beautiful. You're flawless. But it's more than that. The guilt and the shame of the hiding, the nakedness, that too is redeemed. It's a wonderful story. It's your story. You can become a new creation because Jesus takes our sin at the cross and destroys its power over us. And the church is born. What is the church? The church is simply a body of redeemed people. It's not the building or the music or the worship or the organization or the administration. The church is a gathering of people who will willingly transfer from the authority of Adam's fall to the authority of Jesus' victory. You have to cross over in order to become a new creation. Have you done that? Or oh, you might be able to become a member. You might even go through the pool of baptism. You might even be a regular attender and a faithful giver. But the question is not what do you do? The question is now, whose are you? Are you Adam's or are you Christ's? Have you moved from Adam's fall to Jesus' victory? Have you been transferred from a kingdom ruled by darkness to a kingdom ruled by love? Have you moved from being spiritually dead to alive in Christ, from a sinner to a saint? This is your story. You were called to a new nature and to help others establish themselves in that new identity. The story that redeems us can now redeem every other story, even the worst story. I watched a movie over the weekend. It was made in 1969 about a story that started in 1958. A 27 year old preacher from the hills of Pennsylvania walks into New York and says to drug addicts, Jesus loves you. And their response is essentially, well, you'll be meeting him unless you get out of our face. So we should hope he loves you. 27 years of age. 
he touches lives with the story of redemption. You want to change a person? You want to see a culture changed? Give that person, give that culture an opportunity for a different story and teach them to tell it with new language. What does it do? This story touches your past, your present, and your future. God has got it covered. He's before you. He's behind you. He's alongside you. He's above you. He's below you. You're sealed into the story by His Holy Spirit, and so your past is saved from the penalty of sin. Your present is saved from the power of sin, and in the future, you'll be saved from the presence of sin. Now, I just have to tell you something. Remember I said God spoke the world into being with a word? Pretty neat, right? Remember I said Jesus rose from the dead? Quite a feat, right? Well, when I'm talking about becoming a new creation, this is what I mean for the avoidance of any doubt. I mean the power that spoke the world into being, the power that took Jesus from the grave and rose him from the dead, the power that healed the sick, cleansed the lepers, done the miracles, the power that buffs the church in the book of Acts in the upper room on Pentecost and gives them a new language and a new zeal and a new passion and transforms coward to bold apostles. That power, that's the power that lives in us. Little old you. I don't know how I can cope with this. You were never designed to cope, my friend. The power that holds the universe in, face, in place lives inside you. You're not going to cope. By God's grace, you're going to conquer. It's a new story. We don't know what we're saying when we say, I became a Christian. Oh, excuse me. I died and a Christian was reborn. Like Doctor Who getting regenerated, you know? Do you watch that? Quite like that. I have a new nature. I have a new identity. And I have a new purpose. I'm not ordinary. I'm far from finished in terms of God's work in my heart, but I am not walking through this world trying to get by. I'm ruling and reigning over my life through Christ who enables me to have victory over every sin, trial, temptation, circumstance, and choice. I don't have the wisdom or the talent or the gifts to work half of it out, but He does, and He lives in me. Just wake your neighbor up and say, He lives in me. I wasn't asleep and I was listening with my eyes shut. <laughs> so what do we do? Because if we're honest, so many of us, that's what's here, but is it here? It could be that you've never learned to speak our language. It could be that you've never learned to say what you believe is true because you've learned a language. We've all learned it, haven't we? We're learning it from childhood. By the time they're nine months, they've maybe got one or two words. By the time they're 18 months, they've maybe got 50 or more words. They're learning our culture and our language. But we've changed culture and we've changed language and there's nothing we can do but believe. Ephesians 2, verse 8, verse 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's a gift from God, not as a result of works, so that none may boast. We believe God, and God empowers our lives. And you know what happens? You start to realize the life God wants you to live is the life you always wanted. You're never more satisfied in life when you're more delighted with God. So you believe God is good. 
so you can hand him control of everything. You believe he's glorious and he evaporates all your fears. You believe God is good, so you don't have to look elsewhere for your fulfillment. You believe God is gracious, so you don't have to pray to prove yourself, and you start to tell the story. All things are possible. Only believe. And when you believe, well, you just pass it on. How could you keep it to yourself? Or well, Satan will try to stop you, but you talk about Jesus because you love him. Or you will feel inadequate, but the more you talk about him, the more you love him. You will go through moments where you're a bit apathetic and indifferent, like you don't really care, but you keep talking about it because it works. And what happens is when you talk about it during the dry seasons, you recover your first love. And you remember, I love because he first loved me. That's like a glass of cold water on a dry, arid day. Oh, he comes to you and says, pour me a glass from the well, and you pour your heart out from the well of your soul. Do you remember that woman? Jesus says, give me a glass of water. He gets her story. So you pass it on. And you live with truth in your heart. 1 John 4, 4. I'll just paraphrase it. He that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. If you want to grow up, it's time to speak up. We as a body are too quiet. But we can learn. One day at a time, one opportunity at a time, one moment at a time to share our story, we can learn to say what we believe out loud. You can preach to yourself if you never get the opportunity to preach from a platform. Creation, fall. Redemption, new creation. Unless your mind is continually being renewed by these truths, you can find yourself a new creation, but you're still living in original creation. You could find yourself a new creation spiritually, but you're still living in the consequences of the fall. You could find yourself a new creation but you're still trying to work out what this redemption is. That's where I am. What does this identity look like then? Because all the thoughts in my head still sound like the old me. But I take them captive. I review them in light of God's work and God's word, and I say, that's no longer true. This is true now, and I replace it. I'm not a failure. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm not inconsequential. I'm precious and fearlessly wonderful made. My prayers aren't hitting the ceiling. God says, if I pray in the name of Jesus, he will answer my prayers. Oh, what am I doing? Telling myself a story. Don't tell me you don't talk to yourself already. So let's bring it back down to earth and think about how you would tell your story. Well, your story had a start, didn't it? You had a beginning. You weren't born a 45-year-old Pentecostal, charismatic, Holy Ghost jigging. Were you? No, you were born in a manger. It was just the beginning. Creation. This is how we tell our story. This is how it started for me. Or I might say it this way. We tell people what we used to find our identity and our purpose and our significance in before we learned the true creation story. Prior to being a follower of Jesus Christ, I believed all sorts, didn't you? I believed the creation story was about reincarnation and about spiritualism. I was told by a well-meaning person, if your life is so bad, kill yourself because you can go straight to heaven if you kill yourself and there's a hospital for sick spirits in heaven. The creation story I was believing was a lie. Thank God I never acted on the lie. But I start at the beginning. This is what it was like for me. This is what I was doing. This is how I was aspiring. This is where I was driven. This is what it looked like. Then you talk about the fall. Before you knew it was sin, what did you blame? For the things in your life that went wrong. Mummy and daddy. 
the head teacher, the bullies, the area you were raised in, the economic situation you were born into, the friends that turned their back on you. But eventually you came to see all that was really just as a result of sin and as a result of the fall. Then you talk about your redemption. What did you believe would rescue you? Well, I tried to earn money. I tried multiple marriages. I tried a glass of red wine. I tried hobbies and interests and pastimes. I tried education. I tried to somehow save myself from that fall because of that creation. But then I learned only Jesus can save. None of it's satisfied. Only he satisfies. And then you talk about your new creation. What's your hope for the future? Oh, I hoped one day if I was a good person, life might sort itself out. But then I realized Jesus is the only hope for the future. If you want to become an outstanding believer, learn to speak our language. Learn to tell your story. Let me say it this way. Display the truths of Jesus in your life by declaring the truths of Jesus with your mouth. Oh, he'll try and stop you. He's in your gathering whispering too. But Eve was told by God, your son will come and crush his head with your heel. You say, I don't believe in miracles. You say, I do believe in miracles, Satan, because the fact that your head is crushed and you can still speak, that's a miracle. The fact that somebody like you could end up in a room full of people like this, that's a miracle. You will grow if you do. And your faith will too. And God will give you his heart for people. We love because he first loved us. We serve because he loves to serve us. We give because he loves to give to us. We pray because he loves to talk to us. We read the word because the word loves to shape us. We fellowship because he longs to be amongst us. And we share our story because it's his story. And when I feel inadequate, I just remember that all the paint has been reversed and I stand before you telling my story flawless. Oh, I might have a limp and a scar, but I'm flawless. Oh, I might have a limitation or a hindrance, but I'm flawless. Let me tell you the good news. And when you share it, they will hear it. And when they hear it, they'll believe it. And when you see them believe it, you'll be amazed that they believed it. And you'll start to share it with somebody else. And their lives will be touched by it. And a 27-year-old skinny preacher will go into the streets of the Bronx in Harlem and find a young man who's threatening to kill him and tell him Jesus loves him. And eventually the young man will say, I'm going to trust Jesus, Davy." And a Nicky Cruz is born. But to you, he was just a tramp in a slum. Or a Corey Ten Boom is born. But to you, it was just a next door neighbor who drove you crazy. But now they're a new creation. Because they've understood creation. They've understood the fall. They've understood redemption. And they've understood their place in the story. Will you pass it on? Will you give it away? He who wins souls is wise. Amen. Now just pray with me a few moments. Stay online a few more seconds. Stay with me in the room a few more seconds. No distractions. I trust God has blessed you with something that might have helped you today. We'll close with a song. I'm just going to ask you outright, do you need to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Do you need to recommit to following Jesus as your Lord and Savior? 
do you need to understand that there's an action that's your responsibility? God's done what God will do. Your sins are forgiven. Will you accept that forgiveness? His Holy Spirit is ready to empower you. Will you receive that empowerment? His peace is willing to inflict you with his soundness. Do you want it? Do you want to grow as a Christian? Are you prepared to tell your story? I wonder if there's anybody in the room today and you're saying, I need acquainted with Jesus in that intimate way, in that relational way, in that spiritual way. Well, I don't know your heart. I'm familiar with many of your faces, but I don't know your heart. And you could be young or you could be older. You could be here for the first time or you could have been around a while. Do you know him? I want to spend the rest of my life telling my story and making introductions. I would love to introduce you to the High King of Heaven, the Lord of all the earth, who wants to know you and for you to know his love. Or maybe in your old language, the word father brings connotations of something negative, but the father I'm talking about is a new language father, a good father, a kind father. And he wants to receive you through his son, Jesus. If you need the invitation, just let me know. I'd be honored to make the invitation by way of a prayer. You can know him more deeply than you can imagine. You can know him more closely than you ever thought possible. He wants to give you more than you've ever imagined anybody would want to give you. He wants to impart a love into your heart that transforms the direction of the rest of your life. Do you want it? Well, I always pray with my left hand up. It's just what I do. And if you're saying, make that introduction for me, Craig, I'll do it with my left hand up and it will happen immediately by faith in God's Son. I promise you. I promise you. But there's no point in me praying it if nobody wants it. So if you're saying, yes, I'll pray the prayer with you, then you put your left hand up too, and I will see it, and we will pray the prayer together using my words, but we'll both mean it from our hearts. So go on then. My hand is up. You put your hand up right now in the name of Jesus. Go on. Put it up. Now just keep it up a bit longer so that I can see every hand. Thank you so much, sir. That's wonderful. Is there anybody else? Keep it up a few seconds, mate. Thank you. I want to pray for you. Is there somebody else? Oh, God bless you. Keep your hand up. That's wonderful. Keep your hand up. Is there one more? Is there anybody wondering if they should? What harm can it do to reach out to God in this moment? Go on. Put your hand up. Please, be free to respond to God. Well, I have to move on. One last call. One last call. Put your hand up. Please do it. Then, Father, you know the hearts. For these two precious people responding by raising their hand, I ask you to pour out your salvation and your faith, your forgiveness, your mercy and your love. Lavish them in every good thing purchased in the redemption for those that become new creations. And Lord, I pray if anybody online is responding, do the same for them. And if anybody's responding in the room today who never felt comfortable putting their hand up, do the same for them. If anybody's watching this message later or in a, another room in the building, do the same for them. Lord, come with your Holy Spirit and fill them with everything Jesus purchased for them. And let today be a transforming moment from an old creation to a new creation. In Jesus' name, amen. For the rest of you, as we sing the closing song, please stand. There is a Vision Sunday tonight. We'll share it again tomorrow, next Sunday morning, if you can't make it tonight, but do your best. 
But as you worship this song, I want you to pray this prayer in your heart as you worship through this song. Lord, I want to tell my story more than I've ever told it before. Lord, I want to share my hope more than I've ever shared it before. Lord, I ask you to empower me and strengthen me to know the voices of the falls and listen for the whispers of the new creation and the ordinary everyday circumstances of life. Maybe you could just make it a one-sentence prayer. Here I am. Use me. God bless you.